Dr. Ferne Noshir Janwala is a second-generation Indian South African. Her grandparents migrated from India in the 19th century to South Africa. Dr. Janwala was born into an affluent family and unlike many other women of the era, she was encouraged to pursue higher education. Her father Noshir was the director of an oil firm and she was educated at King's College London so her upbringing was most likely a relatively wealthy and progressive one. Well, as a child, uh, I was one of the youngest in the extended family. So when everybody went to school, I was very upset that I was not being allowed to go to school. And uh, we lived in an area which, even in those days, was already seen as a uh, coloured area. But we happened to be living there, though we were of Indian origin. And uh, when I wasn't being allowed to go to the local school, uh, I went to the principal, I walked across the road, went to the principal and asked why I was not being allowed to go to school. Uh, I think it caused amusement rather than took me seriously. But I was the youngest and I was the only one who wasn't being allowed to go to school. And that is sort of one of the motivating factors, I suppose. The family was persuading me that I couldn't just walk into the school. And I said, but I did. <laughs> I remember that because the people keep asking that story, you know, we, me walking and demanding to go. It, I mean, I think it's most of black children, regardless of whether you were Indian, you were colored or whatever, you were always excluded from what you saw. And so the desire was always to say, why, why can't I? Why can't I go to this school? Why can't I do that? And this was, I was not different in that sense. I think most of the children were doing that in one way or another. So it was inevitable that that would have to change. And once all the groups started coming together, we began to change it. On her application form to the Inner Temple, she gave her home address in Fordsburg, historically a multicultural suburb of Johannesburg with strong Indian, Pakistani and Jewish communities. When Frini Jinwala was 16, though a new South African government was elected and promised to make racial division what became known as apartheid a matter of official policy. Our policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighboriness. One of the key legislative planks of apartheid was the Group Areas Act 1950, which gave the government power to decide where different racial groups are permitted to live. Ethnically mixed neighborhoods like Fordsburg swiftly attracted the disapproval of new authorities and shortly after the passing of the Group Areas Act, it was declared a whites-only suburb. Many Indian families were forcibly relocated to a township on the edge of Johannesburg, though the Jinwalas appeared to have avoided deportation at the time of Frini's application to the Inner Temple. They didn't question how we were living in that area because under apartheid rules, we shouldn't have been living there. So uh, for me, but all, 
you see, the other cousins and all were going to university or going into Johannesburg school. But I was the one left, as the youngest child at that time, that I was the one who was left out. Frini Jinwala became active in resisting apartheid while still a young woman. She joined the African National Congress, the main anti-apartheid group in South Africa. She was involved in the establishment of secret escape routes for ANC members following the Sharpeville massacre of 1960. From here, she continued to help ANC members, including Nelson Mandela, to travel out of and back into South Africa covertly. See, the, the laws were different. So you then was working against particular laws as an Indian, as an African, or even as with apartheid, even whether you were Zulu or Kosa or whatever. All of this was there to divide up the total black community, not allow us to come together to fight. Eventually in South Africa, Racial groups had different layers of oppression, if I can put it that way. They were all oppressed, but different layers. So as the pressure grew, the oppressed people also came together. And eventually, as you know, we then had one united front, whether you were colored, you were African, you were Indian, whatever. There was white, non-white. See, that was it. The very fact that it was not something. And so the, all the communities came together. Eventually we overthrew that system, which was something very peculiar in the British uh, colony. So you had what was called the Codessa process, where the parties negotiated the principle of a constitution. And I was drawn into that process as well. And there was some, it was ups and downs. One day you thought you were making progress, the next time you moved back. Because as the National Party moved forward, I don't think they, and maybe I'm wrong, I don't think they had a conception that what we were talking about was a just a, just a democratic society. That is what we were talking about. So they kept wanting to say, assume that we were talking about an all-black society. So they were talking of an all-white society. My experience was at a stage that we were already fighting, you know, from personal experience. Uh, and we came together whether you were colored, you were Indian, you were African, and then amongst, under apartheid, whether you were Zulu, Kosa, or what were you? So that these things were, it was all around you. And inevitably, we gradually came together as, and then it became one struggle. been part of the negotiations and so on, so I knew what was happening and what we were expecting and what we wanted. So by then, all the groups would, you was not something, you're not white. You were called non-whites, you see. So though that brought the other communities together. And we had one struggle. We had excellent leadership, I must say. Uh, we all wrote the constitution. It wasn't a, something that a British government came and handed over. It was something that we went through a long process. This in the constitution, that we want, and so on. And that, I think, helped bring the groups together. Because you realize then that you were not in that group, but you were that excluded from this one. We were all excluded, except the whites. See. It was different ex types of exclusion. So inevitably, you came together. Man's legal status 
a man's political rights, a man's economic opportunities, a man's social position shall depend solely upon the color of his skin. The ANC established a patriotic front, called a conference of all the resistance parties, uh, non-racial obviously. There was a Congress of Democrats, which was whites by then and still legal. And uh, at that, we outlined and had a began to develop a collective vision. It was very vague, but still a clearer vision, very much based on the concept of the Freedom Charter, that this is what we would want in a constitution. And there was agreement amongst all the parties at that point. It didn't matter if you were PAC, you were ANC, Congress of Democrats, because it was broad principles. I was a member of one of those, but I was also head of research in the ANC. So a lot of my work was involved in getting mandates from the provinces, because of provincial ANCs. So that is what we were doing. And then you went into working groups of CODESA. The then Secretary General of the ANC, Comrade Ramaphosa, came round and said Madiba had agreed, Nelson Mandela had agreed, de Klerk had asked to speak last, and he had agreed. And now the ANC was worried because they, they didn't feel they could trust what de Klerk would say. So, uh, could anybody find a way out of that? Now, this was a divine, defining movement, in my view, for a successful constitutional process, or for success that came later. Because what Mr. de Klerk did when he got up was he launched a vicious attack on the ANC and on the ANC leadership. And now the ANC leaders who was, you know, in a sense we were like this, like this, like that. It's almost a U-shaped meeting room. And you could see agitation amongst the ANC top leadership because they were obviously very angry, feeling that the clique was abusing his privilege. And this was a seminal movement in the negotiating process because before that, there was not great clarity in the black community about where we might be going, where we would go. With this attack by de Klerk, Mr. Mandela did not wait to ask for permission to speak. De Klerk's National Party was unwilling at first to consider transferring power to the country's black majority and tried vigorously to institute minority veto power over majority decisions. We made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is a country, a country of many races. There is room for all the various races in this country. There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks. Told it like it was. <laughs> he then attacked the National Party and the National Party leader, exposed what we saw as their two timing. And you could see the consternation on the side of them. But what happened in the streets, which we saw afterwards, it was now a liberated SABC. People came with a hooting as they were going home, back to the townships or wherever they were going, hooting. Put, switch on your radios, switch on your radios, you see. Because there was Mr. Mandela now attacking, and as I put it, putting it the way it was. A lot of people were very, our people were unhappy. They said, what are you all negotiating? You see? Now, the ANC was very clear that we needed a proper constitution so that we had to make sure that in that constitution was that detail that would allow the progress and the realization of the Freedom Charter. So that was the important point at which 
no longer would you be met by friends and colleagues saying, ah, you're one of those who are going to sell us out. There, amongst the black people, there was fear or concern, maybe a better word, that negotiations were not going to lead to full democracy. And so that period was very important. And that's why Codessa and the end of Codessa was extremely important. And then we got down to serious negotiations without any or two faces and produced the constitution we've got now. Our constitution that we negotiated finally is unique in one way, or a first time internationally that I've looked at constitutions, which makes non-sexism, non-racial, essential components of the constitution. I think we're still the only country in the world that have put that. That was a battle because people were saying, no, no, why are you worrying about non-sexism, democracy? We said no as women. By now we had formed in South Africa a women's national coalition with all political parties, all races in it. And from that public process, we had this demand that it's unless we put it in the constitution, the, not democracy was not enough because there are a lot of democratic countries in the world or they call themselves where the question of non-sexism did not feature so that women's campaign produced what became women's agenda for change out of internal co co discussions amongst women and then the battle was to make sure that those things women's agenda for change featured and you will see it throughout the constitution and that is I, I think it's important because we are unique in that and it is the, there's violations now when you see when women are being raped and so on so that putting it in a constitution didn't make it happen but at least gave you constitutional guarantees and it became an important part of the human rights component of our constitution we are saying those interventions must ensure that women are treated equitably. Even as we look at access to land, women must get equitable access to land. Throughout her parliamentary career, the ANC and South African government continued to implement more policies that promoted gender equality. True to her beliefs, she attempted to open Parliament up to all South Africans. The apartheid regime shaped her life significantly. The blatant violations of human rights and democracy were instrumental in establishing her worldview and her commitment to equality for all races, genders and demographics. She contributed towards social programs that devoted to women's issues, have been well run and well funded. In the first democratic national elections of 1994 in South Africa, Freni Jinwala was elected to parliament. The first parliament of the Republic of South Africa. In terms of joint rule 21A, to enable him to deliver his annual address to parliament, I will now grant him the opportunity to do so. The Honorable the President. She was nominated by the ANC caucus and elected by parliament as the first woman to the position of speaker of the National Assembly. A position she held from 1994 until 2004. We set up then the National Assembly, much as it is now, with universal franchise and the Council of Provinces. But at that time, the, what's now the Constitutional Provinces was called the Constitutional Assembly and was given a two-year period to finalize the Constitution. Now, Mr. Ramaphosa from the ANC chaired that. It was all very well to talk of human rights. And we had lots of international constitutions, international conventions, which were blueprints and what were human rights what you you know 
which we wrote into the Constitution. But for us, the biggest challenge has been, and still is, I would say, who delivers those human rights? It's all very well to say, you know, and human rights don't stop at the right to vote. If we say you want clean water, sanitation, it's not the national body that provides that. Under Section 152 of the South African Constitution of 1996, the local government is the engine of basic service delivery. The local government is charged, among other things, with ensuring the provision of services to communities in a sustainable manner, promoting social and economic development, and promoting a safe and healthy environment. The South African Constitution states that municipalities have the responsibility to make sure that all citizens are provided with services to satisfy their basic needs. We're not there's not that enough of a consciousness that the delivery of human rights is very much dependent, dependent on local government. It's one thing to have it on paper. The implementation is always dependent on people, whether it is civil society, whether it's political parties and so on. This is the implementation because what a constitution does is it says and safeguards rights when it's interpreted correctly but it cannot deliver rights there are obligations within our constitution and for many of those rights it is local government that has to do the delivery not national you see and that is not sufficiently uh, done I would very much like us to have, this is a personal view, that we organize now a kind of big conference to develop understanding, not of constitutional rights alone. Constitutional rights and obligations is what we need an understanding of. And that is where we are weak. Because people seem to think if you demonstrate at parliament, you do it for almost everything. Parliament can't deliver that. It's local government that has to deliver that. Of course, Parliament has to make the laws to oblige, but you do separate powers. And, I mean, the national government can say and the political parties can say. I remember sitting, when I was sitting on the national executive, for example, the ANC, we took a decision that by such and such a date, pit latrines would be abolished. Children in schools are still drowning in pit latrines. Hasn't been done. Now, this is the big challenge we have, that the delivery of the human rights, it's no good just passing a resolution at any level. That is the biggest challenge. And it's not that we don't have, sure we have a budgetary constraints. That's difficult, but again, who in the local government decides of the budget how much to do to abolish pit latrines? For example, I'm using that, but there are lots of examples like that. Clean water, all of those things can only be de delivered by local government. And that is something we have to develop an understanding of the obligations and that citizens should be demonstrating and making sure they elect a local government. I'm not talking which political party that is going to deliver, that understands its obligations to actually deliver those rights. It, passing resolutions and laws in parliament alone, national or provincial, is not going to work. Parliament was originally based on the Westminster system. This system was once used in the national and sub-national legislatures of most former colonies of the British Empire upon gaining self-government. 
Inside the chamber, parliamentarians were prohibited from wearing anything other than formal wear, while those voting in a division would not be required to cover their faces. However, since the beginning of the democratic dispensation, it has undergone a series of gradual changes. One of the major changes in the dress code, members of parliament are no longer expected to wear hats and ties. Well, on principle, I'm not going to be critical of Parliament. What I do want to comment on is the hoo-ha about the clothing of the Mr. Malema. He's entitled to his politics, he's entitled to his statements. We took a decision in the National Parliament as a whole and I was speaker then and I made it clear to the parties. I had established a sort of forum regularly to meet with all the chief whips of the parties. Uh, they used to accuse me of bribing them because that meeting used to take place with the finger lunch. <laughs> and we, I said, I'm not going to be the policeman of monitoring the dress of parliament. Because under the previous parliament, men had to wear suits and ties. Women had to wear hats. And I said, I'm not good. That's your job as whips. You decide what you believe. As in my view, as long as members are clean and tidy, that's all you need. Why can't they dress as they wish? I didn't even conceptualize the uh, current position. And in spite of having agreed on that, one of the, I was delighted with the dress. I was particularly delighted because for the first time, you know, people focus on the red uniforms, the miners' helmets. What I was delighted about, if we look carefully, the women dress domestic workers' uniform. I think that early period was much easier because there was, though we had come from very different positions, we had negotiated the constitution. And there was a will amongst all parties to make sure it was harmonious. Also, and what I say now may be controversial, but see, the ANC had such an overwhelming majority that a lot of the parties understood much more that once we had agreed rules as a group, and we did, and the ANC also was part of that process, they were not coming in and saying, this must happen because we ANC say so, you see. Uh, I, I had asked Mr. Mandela, who had pushed me to become speaker, I said, now tell me what sort of parliament do you want? What is it you want out of parliament? So his instructions, and I was very fortunate because Reverend Stofile was the chief whip of the ANC. And he was an established leader, but not one who was and a good negotiator, if I can put it that way. And Mr. Mandela had said, run Parliament the way we ran the negotiations. So I had a meeting with Reverend Stofid, and I said, what do you think that means? And now, in most parliaments, and tradition has been, you have the opposition, you have the government. Whether you sit on the left and right of the speaker could change. But we had a much larger number of political parties. The ANC had a near two-thirds majority. So when the MPs walked in, they moved over beyond the 50% uh, of parliament. And they occupied the front benches because we all came. We didn't know what a front bench was. <laughs> so people just took their seats. And so with Stofile, we said, now, if this is what we need to do, how do we make that parliament a national parliament? How do we make the ANC members, the Freedom Front members, all of them say, that's our parliament? We were fortunate. One, of course, Madida, but you can't deny that authority. 
TV for the first time was much more popular. And for the first time, it was going to become more popular because people are going to watch it. So we must make sure that what they see is going to identify them. Now, if their leaders are sitting right at the back because they've only got two or three members, it's not going to happen. So I said, Stoff, you are the chief whip of the ANC. Move them off. Move all the ANC members who've taken the front seats off and make sure the leader of every political party has a front row seat. And I called the TV cameras and SABC at that time and said to them, I said, look, we've got to build national unity. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you to censor parliament, or, but I am saying, please focus on all the leaders. And this is important. There's no restriction on the media, so it's not a question of enough access, you see. The point is, in most good democracies, the media, it's wide open, and we had it wide open, you see. The only time we had a dispute as to where their offices should be located, and it was when I was speaking, I said, I'm sorry, the first priority for accommodation can't be the media. And these days, you didn't have to be in the parliamentary building with all the TV and other links. So that was the only dispute we ever had with the media. Here, we are fortunate with our constitution, you see, that it does place constraints on everybody. And therefore, it's up to now to the people who are elected to make sure that that constitution and we've had an incredible constitutional court. I must say, I never thought, I hadn't thought about it actually, to be honest, but I never expected perhaps, because somehow one had an illusion that judges were very conservative. The Constitution contains the most important rules of our political system. It protects the rights of the people inside the country and it explains their obligations. It defines the institution of South Africa and what their powers are. All courts in South Africa are independent and subject only to the constitution and law and must apply the law without bias. Our court has been abiding by the constitution and seeing that its obligation is to make sure that all those rights that are in the constitution are actually delivered. If you look at the various judgments, you'll see that's happening. And it's something to be very proud of. I don't think we give them enough credit, but that is something. But Parliament has also got to discipline itself. You know, it's not just a question of one group of people or another group or one political party. And debates and arguments are part of the process. As long as there are no fisticuffs, it's okay. <laughs> done a lot, I mean, apart from my work in the ANC. Uh, and here I should say that we're proud of one thing. We brought back from exile, we are say ANC brought back from exile. We had more offices than the National Party government had embassies at the time of the change. We brought back all our documents, our national archives, and they're all established at Forte. You see. And in, when we delivered them to Forte, President Tambo spoke and said, this is our accounting to the nation of what we did when we were in exile. And we had agreed that it wasn't ANC archivists we were looking for, we were looking for South African archivists. Because who, I wouldn't know what the National Party would see as it's, today I may know, but at that particular point, you know, we'd come out of this confrontational struggle. So we trained 
archivist. We made a partnership with the University of Connecticut. And they trained people who answered public advertisements. One, to take down oral histories. So we had this group of people who were trained to, and we said, we don't want the leaders. There's lots of media coverage of them. Go out, find the activists. And all of, all of these tapes, incidentally, are in Fort Hare. Uh, and also the official documents. And all parties can add whatever they want to. We told them what we were doing. We said, look, we hope because we need national archives. And that's where it was. So 80 million documents were brought back. I don't know what the current state of those archives is. Obviously, there were lots of duplications because of, from that original 80 million. But they've all been now archived. We've got a large number of Africans, of people of all races, and a lot of universities. Western Cape, I know, has a big archive. The white universities had enormous archives. But now what's important is we have a whole lot of national archives. Parliamentary international relations is the continuation of a political process and dialogue among legislatures of the world. At different international meetings, presiding officers and members of parliament have the opportunity to exchange views with their counterparts from other countries on a range of international challenges. The Parliament of South Africa participates in several international forums and organizations. There is an international uh, parliamentary forum. Uh, I know as speaker I had attended it. We have a Pan-African Parliament which we established as a democratic government. And it's based in Pretoria. <laughs> uh, and they send delegations to it. There are a lot of international organizations which South Africa is very much a part of. In many cases, we've taken the lead on some issues, also taken the lead when there is a violation of human rights in some other countries as well. So I think we've played a good role internationally, probably also because we had a lot more international experience than a lot of other post-colonial countries. But anyway, we have played that role and I think we've done very well. We've participated in the UN agencies at different levels. We've helped set up the African Union. We participated and we've made sure, and South Africa's taken the lead in a lot of that, in making sure that we had intra-African organizations, so that as a continent, we often spoke with one voice on international forums. So I think on that we've done well, because it's of course much easier, because then you have one government in the country. And we've carried the population with us. We've, I've not seen our population complaining that you were a member of this international convention or that one. Uh, and I hope they don't, because you can't separate local issues in South Africa, close them up, as they did under apartheid. But we've played a very good role. I think there's good and there's bad. I won't say everything is marvelous. What we do have is we have the capacity, the legal capacity to deliver the human rights that we fought for while we were in the struggle and that we implemented in that constitution. But constitutions don't deliver human rights. You see? It's an ongoing struggle to do that. And this is where we have not done enough yet. I think maybe I'm being optimistic to think we'd have delivered them all by now. But we've got to look at our constitution, not only about rights, but rights and obligations. And that brings squarely to local government. So you can pass the laws, 
You can even have the money to have, but the delivery comes to local government. And there, perhaps we are not doing enough to mobilize support and thinking in those terms. That is why I would like us to start a project on constitutional rights and obligations in schools, you see. Now, I know we produced booklets during Codessa in comic book form for educating people about their rights, but we need one now on rights and obligations, and we are weak on the obligations, because even if you've got this marvelous court delivering the right judgments, you see, it doesn't give you rights. That delivery of rights is the big challenge. So I, that is where I think the cons are. The framework is great. The process of democracy, I can't say you should not have elected that local government or you shouldn't have developed that. It would be incorrect because people elect for people they want. If you create the right framework, if you stress the obligations, they will elect people who deliver, much more so. At the moment it is within much narrower, but you still, I'm not suggesting you abolish the party system. I think it's entrenched now. And I've not known of any democracy that has not had political. You people have got to organize. Whether they call it civil society or they call it political, doesn't matter. So that is very good, but it is the delivery. And therefore I would like us to start talking much more about constitutional obligations and address the people who are responsible for that delivery. So maybe the demonstrations should not be only at parliament or at the provincial parliament, but at local councils. Implement the clauses that require councillors to have regular reports to the community. But we're not doing that. Political parties are not doing that. It's not enough to have a political party reporting. The councillors should be reporting to the communities. The mayors should be reporting regularly. And that's where we failed. We haven't done enough. Not failed, but we haven't done enough. After retirement as speaker, she continued serving in a number of international organizations, including UN subsidiaries, as trustee of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and as chancellor of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Throughout her parliamentary career, the ANC and the South African government continued to implement more policies that promoted gender equality. The apartheid regime shaped her life significantly. The blatant violations of human rights and democracy were instrumental in establishing her worldview and her commitment to equality for all races, genders and demographics. She contributed towards social programs that were devoted to women's issues, have been well-run and well-funded. When Dr. Jinwala stepped down in 2004, the country was markedly improved for the better. Jinwala maintains her interest in promoting democracy, good governance, development, human rights, and human security. Her excellent contribution to the struggle against gender oppression and her tireless contribution to the struggle for a non-sexist, non-racial, and democratic society will live for generations to come.